So good morning. I'm uh, Dr. Gay Carlson, president of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry with number 15 of my Screenside Chats for our ACAP members. Screenside Chats are meant to share timely clinical practice and other information from experts on key topics during the COVID-19 pandemic continuing to plague us. Reminiscent of President Roosevelt's fireside chats during the Great Depression and World War II, I'm hoping they'll be informative, comfortable, and fill a niche not addressed by other materials available to you. Our chats today grows out of my discussion last time with Dr. David Brent on suicide prevention. One of his recommendations was that parents monitor their child's media and screen use. He was addressing it specifically because kids learn about suicide uh, on the uh, internet. And so it's really important to provide some parent monitoring. So I've asked Dr. Paul Weigel to give us some legs or put some legs on that recommendation. Dr. Weigel is Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine in Farmington, Connecticut. He specializes in the effects of screen media on the mental health of youth and has written extensively in journal articles, book chapters, and our own ACAP news. He's not only a longtime member of ACAP's media committee, he's currently the co-chair and serves on the National Scientific Advisory Board for Children in Screens, which is a really nice series, I must say, uh, the Institute of Digital Media and Child Development. It's actually located out of Stony Brook, I'm proud to say. This week, we'll talk about not just why parents should monitor screens, but how and what to do with some of the conflicts that arise. So Paul, first, why is it important for, for parents to monitor their kids' screen use? Well, we live in an unprecedented time in, in so many ways, but, um, but uh, in one way, it's the way that screen media has really come to dominate the lives of so many young people. Um, since uh, the year 2000 to 2019, um, research shows that, that screen media for entertainment use has, has roughly doubled uh, among kids to an average of about seven hours a day, which over the course of a year is about twice as much time as they were spending in school. And, and of course, COVID um, really only exacerbated this trend so that, that uh, by some measures, uh, screen media entertainment increased by another 50% to really come to, um, again, to, to fill the days and fill the, the free time uh, for so many uh, young people. And, and we as child psychiatrists are seeing more and more that uh, a child's screen media habits are really intertwined with their, with their mental health issues for better and, and oftentimes for worse. Um, now, now it's, it's true and a wonderful thing that all this screen media time has displaced dangerous, uh, risky activities. Um, uh, drug and alcohol use has, has uh, declined. Um, uh, uh, driving unsafely has, has declined. Teen pregnancy is, has declined. Um, and, and violence. Um, however, uh, all this, this time does come at a cost. Um, it, it displaces really important healthy balance to the life that, that kids need not only for growth and development, but also for physical and mental health. And I'm talking about adequate time for sleep, uh, in-person socializing, family activities, uh, chores, uh, physical activity, and, and even balanced diet. Um, all of these things suffer when a child is spending um, the majority or, or, um, of their free time on, on screen media. And, and this may be why many studies show that those who spend the most time on screen media are the most likely to suffer from depression. And of course, there's other specific experiences young people can have online, which are, are, are even more concerning. And, and, and those are involvement with cyberbullying, risk, risky sexting behavior, um, uh, excessive pornography engagement, violent video games, uh, fear of missing out on social comparison on social media. And, and 
so it's so important to have this healthy uh, balance in life. But but screen media is becoming more and more engaging, right? So so as it becomes um, uh, more you know media gratification, the video games become more sophisticated and um, and habit forming. It makes it harder and harder for kids to make healthy choices about their screen media uh, habits on their own. So so a lot of kids really need parents to step in and um, and set up structure and, and, and be a guide for their screen media use. Well, that, 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 that's a sizable task under the circumstances. It sounds like, you know, the kid in the candy store is surrounded by everything he's ever wanted, and then the parent comes in and says, you can't have any of it. So, uh, <clears throat> So I don't know that you're going to get a lot of pushback from parents that they ought to do that. How do they go about doing it? Mm, yeah, well, uh, that's a great point. And, um, uh, and, and of course, the, as in many other things, uh, it's best to start at the beginning, right? And, and a pound, or an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so one way to think about this is when parents introduce a new device into their lives of, 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 of young people. You know, Christmas is coming and a lot of kids are gonna be getting their first uh, cell phone or their first or a new video game console or a personal computer. And, and, and most parents, we, we introduce these devices into the lives of our kids with some trepidation, but really without much of a plan and with sort of hopes that it's going to, um, that the kid's going to use it responsibly. And, and what many of us find is that these devices can become something like a Pandora's box in the lives of young people where they're so easy to introduce, but they can quickly with, with many come to dominate their, their free time and, and cause a lot of issues that are then harder to correct. So ideally, um, ideally whenever parents introduce uh, the first, first cell phone or first video game console or even a new one they already have a plan um, beforehand for how and when the device can be used and how the, the parents are going to supervise the use of that device and as with many other things it's best to start um, uh, relatively strict right with um, with more rules and controls and then as a child shows that they're uh, able to handle the device responsibly and in a healthy way then the controls can be uh, eased up over time but and there's so, so, so role play with me oh, God, my cell phone! <laughs> So yes. what's, what's dad going to say to me? <laughs> All right. I do want to pause and hit the rewind button because okay. this father has already, um, he has already taken a look at the device and he has um, started it up and he set parental controls on the device. It doesn't matter whether it's a phone, a tablet, or an Xbox. They all come with controls that that not only um, to, will um, will screen certain material or certain uses of the of the device, but also when it can operate and how much time it can operate. So that's already uh, that's already set. Now now parents who don't know how to do this um, will simply do a Google search or a YouTube search. A video will walk them through how to do it and lock with a password. Okay, so that that's the first point. Yes. What what do you what what do you YouTube uh, monitoring your screen use or sure, sure. you might say. Um, uh, Xbox uh, Series X, that's the new one coming out uh, this week, um, uh, parental controls, okay. you have a set up. And uh, either YouTube or, or go to the ESRB website or Common Sense Media, there's a lot of different places, but just Googling it is the easiest way. Many parents ask their kids to help them set those up. That's what we want to discourage. <laughs> okay. All right. That's kind of like, how, how many drinks should I have here? Okay. So, um, no, but, the, but that's, the, that's an important point. So the, the devices come with parental controls. Parent does have to figure out how to use them, recognizing probably that the kids can outsmart them in, in how to um, obfuscate it, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And the, the kids that need the rules most are the ones who are most motivated to, uh, to go ahead and, and subvert those controls. And kids can do it. Um, and so uh, that's why uh, these controls are not a replacement for, for traditional supervision, but they are a supplement and they can be really effective. And a lot of them will give, like for instance, for the iPhone, will give a weekly update to the parent about how the device is being used so that, that the parent can kind of monitor it in that way as well. But at any rate, so, so, so... But that right there, it sounds like there needs to be a rule that says every Saturday morning, I'm going to take your phone and I am going to look at, or I don't know, again, it, it, 
I, I don't think you can be too specific about giving people some structure for this because I don't know that they can, they always think about these things. Yes, I, I agree. Um, but it is very helpful that there's a rule from the beginning that the parent can take a look at it uh, at any time, especially with young kids. With older teens, maybe not, but, but with younger kids, absolutely. And that way, the parent doesn't feel like they're spying or it doesn't come as a, as a shock. Um, mm -hmm. And then every once in a while, you know, uh, take a look at stuff um, uh, together. Now, um, the other thing is that, the, is that the parents have talked together before the gift and, and talked talked about how, you know, how they want to, um, uh, the child to use uh, the device as well. So, and, and have some ideas for uh, ground rules set up in, in their mind. So that when, when the child opens the device and they're so excited, as you mentioned on, on, on you know, at Hanukkah, or Christmas morning or, or, or whatever, their birthday, they will um, uh, already sort of have this, um, uh, the, the, these rules uh, set up. How about for those where the uh, cat is already out of the bag? I, mm -hmm. You know, it's it, you've given the you've given the teen the keys to the car, and you haven't set any parameters about uh, driving while intoxicated, being back by ten o'clock, not having other passengers in the car, uh, wearing your glasses, you know, et cetera, et cetera. How do you get how do you get that toothpaste back in the tube or the cat? Yeah, so. Bag? That, that's a great analogy. It can, and it can be overwhelming, you know, uh, for parents. And, and again, the kids who need those rules the most are the ones that we're going to fight them uh, the most and try to subvert them the most. So, um, so the, the idea is to, uh, first is to set up sort of a, a, a uh, is to have a, a daily routine, have structure in the lives of young people, especially important during this uh, COVID era, when a lot of the, the structure that kids had in their day has been eroded. Um, but parents want to think about that, that kids need time time for for sufficient sleep, so important for mental health, to get their schoolwork done, chores, family, socializing, self-care, meals, um, uh, and physical activity. So, so that's the ideal, right? But as you say, that's a mouthful, right? So let's start from the beginning. First thing parents can do is um, it's very helpful to have a rule that screens are not, are not allowed in the bedroom. Right. That is um, something that that not only are just screens in the bedroom subvert sleep um, there, perhaps more importantly, when they're in the bedroom behind the closed door, the parent can't supervise it. Right. So that's that is the first sort of a rule. If we only had one rule about screens, that would be it. And, and the second is that that screens are turned off um, before bedtime. Ideally, a, a good hour before bedtime. Some of these um, games and, and social media can be so, um, uh, they can increase arousal, they can be so engaging and exciting that it actually takes longer time to fall asleep mm -hmm. after you do it, even once you turn it off. Um, and of course, the, the screens remain off uh, through the night. The third um, is grandma's rule, right? You, um, uh, many of us are familiar with the, with the traditional rule that you get to have fun after you do your chores, after you do your schoolwork, that kind of thing. So, so setting that structure into the day um, can be really helpful as well, right? Um, uh, another thing that, that we might want to think about now, if a kid is involved in many different uh, activities, and of course the more activities kids are involved in, the less important screen rules are, right? Because they already have structure in their day. And, and it does fall upon um, parents, if they're going to be restricting screen media use, to really encourage, a lot of kids need, need a lot of encouragement to engage in other hobbies, to do a sport, to do family activities. Now's a great time to learn to cook or encourage reading for fun, that kind of thing. Um, but many kids, you know, these days, it's really hard with, with, with athletic activity shut down and a lot of traditional social activities just not safe. Um, a lot of kids have a lot, you know, a great deal of time even after their schoolwork and chores have been completed. So, so um, in these kind of situations, it's helpful to just have screen free times in the home. For instance, at my house, um, every day from two to five, my, my teens and, 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 and my wife, that they, they turn off the Wi-Fi, collect the phones, and just have a screen-free uh, period. And of course, having a screen-free period during dinner time is really important as well. As it's a, and for many families, it's the only chance to sort of um, uh, interact in a, in a free and open way. 
Um, so, uh, of course, uh, it's also important for parents to encourage educational, creative, and social content. Not all screen media is the same, right? Playing Call of Duty isn't the same as Zooming with, with family or friends, and, and, and making music online is, is really different than, than just scrolling through social media pages or going from YouTube video to YouTube video. Finally, I do want to say that, um, that uh, it's important always to look in the mirror and for parents to um, uh, be mindful of their own screen media habits, right? Um, studies show, and my experience has, has taught me painfully, that we are not as good at being parents when we are looking at screens as we like to think that we are, right? Um, my kids will come and tell me something and I'll say, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, I, I think at the time that I'm paying attention, but later on I have no memory. And, and and we're also less patient with our kids, we're less available for our kids. So we should really strongly consider following the same rules that we set for our kids around screen media use. You know, the, um, the reality of the situation, and, and again, you, you mentioned about that this was already complicated before COVID, but since then, um, there really it, it is much more, you, you can't, necessarily say to somebody, you know, go ride a bike, you know, go to George's house or, you know, whatever, go to the mall, get out of my face. Um, yeah. You can't do that. And so um, we've got the situation about, um, and, and, you know, it's, it's fine. We can talk, uh, I don't, I've got a job. I think you have a job. I, we're, we're, we're just so incredibly lucky at this point that um our lives are disrupted, but I'm not worried about where my next meal is coming from. I'm not worried about um, so far, you know, my husband or somebody dying in the next room. Um, I, I, um, I don't know how those considerations, I mean, I do know how they complicate life. It's just sometimes easier to get the kid out of your face and have a babysitter occupy the kids time because you've got a job to do or you've got dinner to cook or you've got you know dad to take care of or whatever any thoughts about that yeah i mean you're absolutely right and and uh and it's not a simple thing um for many families in fact um you know and, and studies show that the more stresses that families have especially economic stresses um the less uh, the more the more time the kids spend on screen media. And of course, it, it makes sense, you know, for a parent with few supports, for a parent who works, and uh, for a single parent, um, it, it's, it's exponentially more difficult to establish you know, uh, healthy habits and um, uh, for, for screen media use for kids. And, and so, and the more stressed parents are, of course, uh, the, more, the more difficult it is in general. Um, and this has come into especially sharp, sharp contrast with parents who are working during the day while their kids are, are going to school online and oftentimes distracted, um, you know, from school by, uh, by trying to multitask or looking at screen media or social media or even trying to play games while they're supposed to be doing their schoolwork. Um, so it is important to recognize and, and, and for parents to, um, you know, not to feel guilty about that. You know, other things take precedence sometimes and a little extra, you know, screen time is not going to, um, isn't going to kill kids. It's not going to be directly toxic, but also to be mindful of what, um, what structure they can put in place for kids. Is there, and I don't know, I'm just winging it here. My, my kids fortunately have grown up, though I have to say, we, we, we have the same cat and mouse game that parents have with kids, you know, and, and when my kids were younger, it was the TV that was the, uh, was the um, enticement. And no matter what I did, uh, they always found a way around it. And so finally what had to happen was my husband had to disconnect the television and nobody watched television. I mean, that was basically what happened. Mm -hmm. um, I, that, that's a bit draconian, and I don't think it's even possible to do it because there's so much that kids have to do academically with their screens that I think that poses an extra problem. I know, you know, parents will say, but he tells me he's doing a search on blah, blah, blah. I don't know whether he's looking at whatever. So how about, how about those kinds of situations where um, 
you know, unless you're sitting and looking over the kid's shoulders, you don't know whether there's a comic book inside of his encyclopedia or whether there's a, uh, whether, yes. you know, he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. That's a great point. And, and, um, and, you know, for, for some families doing what, 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 uh, you know, what, what you did with the television, what your husband did, is what's best for kids in, in some situations. Sometimes having, the, you know, for some kids, it becomes such a struggle that just not having, you know, the, the, the smartphone or the tablet or the Xbox um, is, is really, it makes, is, is better for everyone. Um, now, that said, um, but, but, but having, you're right, having a personal computer is really not an option at this point, right, when kids have to do remote learning. Um, so, um, uh, for that reason, I, I think it's really important whenever possible for kids to be doing their, um, their educational screen time in a public area of the home, right? And um, so at the, at the, the kitchen table, um, something where, where adults can, can supervise a little bit better, right? Um, so you're, and it's, it's never possible to catch everything. And we parents, we don't have to, you know, um, we don't have to uh, be perfect. And we, we don't have to establish rules perfectly, but, but, but there's certain things a kid can do in their bedroom behind closed doors. You know, they can be playing Call of Duty when they're supposed to be on um, uh, doing a class, whereas they really can't do that on the kitchen table, even with the parent walking by every one to, you know, one to 10 minutes or something like that. Um, so it does, um, it does make a difference. Um, certain times, you know, uh, filters can be helpful. Another thing I think it's really important is to do the uh, entertainment screen time whenever possible in a different setting, right? So the entertainment screen time might be in the living room or, um, uh, or, or, or somewhere else on a different device, you know, uh, rather than having it all on the same uh, computer sitting in the same spot. It's really helpful to make that division um, and to make, you know, work time about work and, and screen time about, uh, about entertainment whenever possible. How would you suggest doing the reset? So I didn't do the things that I should have done. I gave away the keys to the kingdom. Yes. <laughs> and now we've got to um, now we've got to do a reset. Yes. And I don't know. Maybe the holidays is a good reset time. Maybe the new year is a good reset time. Mm. It, that that seems to me, especially with older kids, that you end up with a dialogue rather than a. A rule. I, you know, I've been, I've been struggling with, as we all have, how do you get people to obey the social distancing and mask rules? And, um, you know, we're, we're not, we're not doing it as enthusiastically as we did six or seven months ago. And I think the death rates and the infection rates are showing that. Yeah. But as, as much respect as I have for, well, I live in New York and, and I think Cuomo has really done a heroic job. At a certain point, this isn't working. And, and there needs to somehow be a collaborative thing that goes, well, you know, I really want the bars and restaurants to be open. I really want the kids to go back to school. People are dying by the thousands. We're running out of healthcare workers. What would you do? What is your suggestion for how to get past this you you, you, you know you don't want me to, to, to be draconian about that what is your suggestion yeah and so of course and as kids you know get older um our, our goal is to um uh to enable them to make healthy choices for themselves and and you're right that that um uh, that oftentimes we don't what we don't want is to kind of get in a power struggle with our kids we don't want that to be our relationship with kids we want to be more of a guide and less of a cop um as they uh, especially as they get older. And one way that you can uh, do that is to invite collaborative rulemaking. Essentially, you say, look, you know, I, I, I think it's, 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 it would be much healthier if there was, you know, if there was limits, if the screen time was, you know, whatever, three hours a day instead of eight hours a day, um, you know, what can we do about this? And, and to really, you know, invite sort of brainstorming um, to be uh, open to listening to kids' ideas about that. And, and one way you can do that is just to write down every idea. The kid says, well, you know, one option is I can just have as much as I want. One option is I could have all the time on the weekend and none during the weekdays and parents might you know write down their ideas as well um, and then sort of and, and try to have an open mind um, and and show respect for the, the
the kids' ideas. And then the parent and child can look at the list together, both say, you know, which ones are the least acceptable to them and, and, and that are, you know, that are more in the middle and try to come up with a, uh, a compromise. And, um, and, it's, and, and just be willing to try things. And it may be that you try something and it doesn't seem to be working out and you have to kind of look at it again. But kids are more likely to follow rules if they feel invested in them. And they're more likely to feel invested in them if they help to make them uh, themselves. Um, and, and, and also, um, it's really, you know, it, it's important to sort of uh, have an ongoing dialogue about social media choices, hopefully not, not a one-time talk, but, but really over years. And one way to set the foundation for that is to watch shows and to, um, and to go on social media and to play video games together with kids. A uh, way to understand you know, what, what's important to them, share an enjoyable experience, and being able to talk you know, with, some, uh, you know, with, some, uh, with some validity about the experiences they're having. And, and when, of course, when we want, we want kids to engage in a dialogue, it's really helpful if we have a curious attitude, if we validate their point of view and do what we and we try to keep ourselves from doing what we parents of course often do naturally which is to jump to judgment and to tell them the right answer right um and even to shame them now you shouldn't have gone on that website or you really you know you shouldn't do that um to be able to you know, have kids feel safe in talking about um screen media and sometimes to share some of the issues that we're having in a reasonable way um you know if i if i um, talk with my kids about, you know, I'm, I'm concerned that you're up too late, you know, um, uh, you know, playing that game, you know, they immediately jump to the defensive. But when, but when I talk about, you know, like, I, I, I jumped on for a sec to look at this. And then, and then by the time I realized it, it was much later, and I, I was, you know, I had this work to do, then they'll, they feel much more free to say, Oh, yeah, that happens to me all the time. And this is what I do. Um, so, Disclosing your own issues can be a, you know, a healthy thing. And of course, the goal is to keep the conversation going and to encourage critical thinking about social media choices in kids. The um, one topic that I don't know whether we'll have time to cover in this, but um, if you have a fast answer, maybe we can. The phonectomy. You take away the phone and the child has a meltdown or you thre threaten to take away the phone and the child has a meltdown. I mean, a police calling meltdown. I mean, you know yes. the ones I mean. Yes. Any thoughts and, about that? Yeah, I mean, the, and the kids who are the most psychologically dependent on their device, the ones who need the limits the most are the ones who are gonna have the most um, a reaction. And, and it's true that kids can, um, can, uh, they can sort of precipitate a psychological crisis. And that's why it's important to have a routine where, um, uh, where, where kids, but, but parents need to be able to do that. They really you know, do for all but the oldest uh, and healthiest teens. So to be able to collect it, that's why it's important to have a routine where kids get off the screens regularly at a time that's pre, pre, uh, you know, predetermined. And, and, and of course, the biggest one beside the phone is video games, right? When mm -hmm. it comes time to turn off the Fortnite, it is really hard. They, these they, these um, games are engineered to mm -hmm. keep us engaged and it can be really jolting and, and frustrating, very frustrating to suddenly stop. So, um, so it's best if sort of the expectation is there beforehand that at this time you're going to turn it off or at this time we're going to put our, we're going to charge our phones and, and leave them in the parent's bedroom every night. So the kid is used to that. So they develop these, you know, uh, the ability to separate from that. Some things that can be helpful, um, setting an alarm um, by which a kid, a kid can't start a new game, for example. So let's say they play Fortnite. Fortnite lasts like 15 minutes. So maybe um, uh, on average. So maybe 10 or 15 minutes beforehand, alarm goes off, and that means no new games, and you know you got to start thinking about finishing up. During that time, it can be helpful if a parent sits with the kid because they're going to be tempted to start a new game anyway. If a parent's there, they can, they can kind of learn a little bit about the game, maybe play with the kid, and, um, and be a reminder that this is going to happen. And when kids are successful, right, when, they, when they're able to turn it off without uh, a tantrum, of course, we parents want to notice that and and encourage that and praise that um, and when they don't 
you know, oftentimes the consequences are needed, and that might be no screens tomorrow, but we want to remember to minimize negative affect or, or expressions of negative affect. So we want to have a neutral attitude as much as, as, as possible. And we want to, unlike what I'm doing now, we want to speak as little as possible, don't over-explain or get drawn into a debate, right? right? And, and finally, it's important for us parents to pick our battles. The kid gets off, but they roll their eyes and grumble and stomp a little bit. Maybe it's not worth it. You just ignore it, right? Um, and, uh, and keep, uh, keep um, uh, pick your battles and, 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 and only focus on what's really important. Okay. So I think, I think maybe that, that's going to lead us to the next screen side chat, which is on limit setting in general. And that, that, that I think is, is a fairly long topic. Okay. I think you've covered a lot of really important things, Paul. <clears throat> it's probably worth mentioning that like holiday eating, when you put on 10 or 15 pounds, even though you know you don't necessarily want to do that, you're going to have to pay a price at the other end. If you're willing to pay a price at the other end and go on a diet and walk a lot and so forth and get down to your normal weight, you have a fighting chance. The, the, the difficulty, of course, comes if you're not able to reel that in again. So anyway, I really appreciate your time and um, I thank you and I thank our listeners. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I, I just want to say supervising screen media is tough, but it is absolutely possible. It's really important and it's a great gift to kids and us. And we as providers, we can inform and support parents so they can do just that. Yeah, I get that is our job. All right. Thank you. And thank you all. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you all very much for tuning in. This is Gay Carlson for ACAP's Screenside Chats.